Welcome back to Have Some Style, the show and channel that discusses all matters of personal style and helps you find yours. I'm Moshe Lundstrom Halbert. I'm a fashion journalist and style expert, and I believe that what you wear is self care. I'm so excited for today's episode because it's a first for Have Some Style. We are welcoming our very first guest. So when I was thinking about who this person could be, I really wanted it to be someone that for me encapsulates this intersection and really holistic approach that we've been discussing here on Have Some Style, where your personal style is reflected in all areas of your life. And with that in mind, there was only one person to include on this episode of Have Some Style, and that's Mr. Arvin Olano. If you don't know Arvin, you're probably like, who? And if you do know Arvin, you're freaking out right now because Arvin is a YouTuber who has blown up just in the past year and change for his revolutionary and cheeky and funny and chic takes on how you can elevate your personal style through how you decorate. And he has a wonderful YouTube channel, which is where I first discovered him. It's now grown to over 300,000 subscribers. He's gone on to do partnerships with brands like CB2 and Domino and Studio McGee. And he's really become like a darling of the interior design world. And also what you can't help but enjoy about his videos is that he always looks amazing and unique. And the way he dresses looks so great in the spaces that he's created. There's such a through line there, which is why I thought Arvin would make such a brilliant guest to talk about how he really cultivated this personal style that is ever evolving. He just is kind of the internet's secret weapon and best friend when it comes to really great style that feels inclusive. It's never snobby, but it's very elevated and is uniquely his own. And I think that's what I'm trying to do here on Have Some Style, what Arvin's done so beautifully on his channel, which is just encourage everyone to think, how can they make something more them, more personal, more beautiful? How can they try to get the best thing they can afford and style it in a way that feels very unique to them? So without further ado, let's turn it over to the one and only Arvin Olano. Tell us about where you grew up and if you could describe what your environment looked like and felt like from an early age. Yeah, absolutely. So I was born in the Philippines and I grew up around a big family. All of my cousins, my uncles, my grandparents, we all lived near each other. So growing up, I just felt like learning about how it feels to have that family support. And it was just very loving. And I think I, I learned a lot from all of my family growing up in the Philippines. And then I moved to California when I was 10. And shortly after I moved to Vegas, which is where I am now. If you could look back, what would you say are some of your earliest fashion and style memories that pop into your mind, these aesthetic moments that made an impression on you as a young person? You know what's funny? Living in the Philippines, I didn't look at fashion the way I do now. And it wasn't until I moved to the U.S. and California and going to grade school. I will never forget this one day. I want, I like threw on this really simple t-shirt, but I wore this like kind of baggy ripped denim. And I remember at the time, this wasn't like a thing, like no one wanted to wear ripped jeans. It was kind of like messy, but something in me that day, I was like, I'm going to wear these. And I went to class by third period. I was getting sent to the principal's office because we are not allowed to wear ripped denim in school. And I remember in the Philippines that I, 
well, we wore uniforms in the Philippines. So in, you know, in California, there was this dress code that I didn't really know much about. And I remember taking my backpack. I I was walking to the principal's office and I thought to myself, I was like, why should I be sent home for wearing something that I felt good in? And I remember the rule was something ridiculous. It was like you you were either sent home or they provided you with with clothes that, you know, followed the rules. And I was like, why should I why should I follow that? I I feel good in these. So I didn't go to the principal's office. I walked around the the courtyard and waited until the bell rang and went to fourth period and I went on about my day and I I remember that moment. I just knew I'm I I was meant to break rules. <laughs> it was like a fashionable protest, you know? You were standing up for Absolutely. who you are and what you believed in and how you wanted um to present yourself. Uh I was also wondering what are who were some of the people that uh were in your life growing up that really shaped who you are and kind of helped you formulate where you wanted to go and your style as well. Definitely my parents and my grandparents. My parents taught me to be patient, to be kind to people, and they taught me how to forgive people. So my grandpa was a politician my entire life when I was growing up. And I just remember being young and going to all of the rallies and the campaigns and watching him on stage be this like larger than life leader. And at the time I didn't understand what that meant, but I knew that I wanted to be somewhere near that or somewhere something like that when I grow up. And that really helped shape who I am today looking back at all those memories of of my parents and my grandparents. When did you first start to show an interest and really have a strong opinion on having a style that was maybe different than your peers or than everyone else? Or were you conforming from an earlier age into what your peer group and environment was into at the time? That's such a great question because I felt like I struggled to find who I was as a person growing up, especially as an immigrant going into a country where everything felt foreign to me. And I think it goes back to that time when I was, you know, in grade school and in high school, I was trying to fit in. So I I was like, let me dress like everybody else so I can feel like I belong. And then I found myself dressing like nobody in the school. So I, I experimented with different styles and colors. And I I got excited about dressing up for, for school. So I would do all of my little outfits the night before so that the following day I can feel confident. And I think when you feel confident, you just have a better day. And that's how I felt going into class. I was like, I'm, I'm going to fit in and I'm going to fit in in my own way. And where are we now in your life? Are we in Las Vegas? Yes. Yes. So I went to high school here in Vegas. And I feel like that was the time for me to experiment and kind of get to know myself and my personal style. Mm. Did you ever run into any hurdles or, you know, bullies or kind of crises of confidence when you were sort of figuring out who you were at that pivotal age? I will say I was lucky that I never got bullied when I was in high school. I feel like I've heard a lot of horror stories of other people growing up and that never happened to me. I was just able to express myself fully. Um, even though at times it, it, I did feel scared, like, should I wear this or should I wear something that's a little more feminine? And at the time, I, I wasn't out in high school. Um, so I was kind of, I feel like I was hiding my true self. You know what I mean? I was, I was telling a lie because I really wanted to wear something that was more fashionable, but I was a little bit scared because I wasn't out yet. 
So I will say, I think in, in high school, I kind of played it safe. And it was a journey for sure. I, I, I didn't kind of blossom until I was in college and I started um, dancing with a team. That's so interesting. Yeah, I was going to ask, what do you think was the turning point or what might have been the piece in your wardrobe or the event or the moment that made you start to be a little bit more um, expressive with who you are on the inside uh, reflected in your, in your style? Was that in your in your work in dance? It was. It was. So I started dancing in my junior year in high school and I did it all throughout college. I came out when I graduated and I felt like I was able to breathe and just like have this burden, you know, get rid of all this like internal struggles of Mm. hiding myself and concealing my true identity and, and being among my dance friends who accepted me for who I was. There was no judgment. There was no, don't wear this because it's too feminine or don't wear that because you're not supposed to. I wore the most, you know, amazing, like experimental clothes when I was dancing both on and off stage. And I was able to express who I was as a person in a new form, which was dance and movement and fashion. It was all in one. That's so interesting because I do really strongly believe in this kind of like mind-body connection. And when you find a way that you can be connected with your body, be it through dance or maybe it's yoga or maybe it's going on a long walk or some form of expression or just like even just getting those endorphins, making you feel alive, like a real person makes you sort of realize how precious life is. You only have one shot at this and you want to be your best, truest self and, you know, not be shackled by these um, ideals of what you're supposed to be in life or maybe what your family might be expecting of you. You just, you need to kind of set yourself free. So it sounds like you did that in a really beautiful way. Um, on stage or on the dance floor in performance mode. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think this goes back to that day when I wore that ripped denim. I just, I had to break the rules. I had to break the norm and I had to start paving my own path. So let's speak about your work in the fashion industry. And if you could tell us a bit about your background and how you got into luxury fashion. Yeah, I think going back to high school, I I knew that I wanted to be in the fashion industry. And I don't know if it was when I was young, my mother gave me a nice little luxury gift from a luxury brand, but something along those lines happened. And I was like, I want to be in the luxury industry. I, I, I was like, this is, this is cool. I like this. So I went to school for fashion marketing and retail management at the art institutes here in Vegas. And when I graduated high school, or when I graduated, I worked for a a number of luxury brands, but ultimately I worked for Gucci for almost seven years before doing YouTube and being a creator. Mm. And t- tell us a bit about the era that you were at Gucci for, because there was a lot of transition during that time, right? Yes. You know, what's funny when I worked for the brand, it wasn't like my favorite. I've always thought Gucci to be more like mature. It was like the older client that worked there. And for the first year or so, that's what it was. You know, the clients that were coming in were definitely more established and mature. And it wasn't until fall of 2015 when a new creative designer, Alessandro Michele, was appointed to to the helm. And that was incredible. Like it, being a part of the brand at that time was just just wow. Like I was at the forefront of this like huge change in the brand. And it was about being inclusive and dressing as you are, coming as you are. I've never felt more seen and accepted as a person than when I was working at the, at Gucci at the time. Like I, I saw myself 
on the runway and in the brand because of because of Alessandro Michele and how he was designing around this idea of fashion should be like a global conversation and breaking rules and wearing what you want and just being yourself. Isn't that amazing? Like the power of a visionary leader, creative director. I was just reminded the other day that he only in 2015, when he debuted that first menswear collection, he only had five days to put it together from the time he was like, isn't it's just. It was very exciting. I remember when that fashion show, um, that fall 2015 fashion, fashion show happened. And just the first few looks, I was like, oh my gosh, this is it. This is what the brand was waiting for. And I remember my colleagues did not understand it at the time, but I, I just knew that this was what the brand needed. And this is what I needed to see. And it, it was almost like this pivotal moment where it was like, it was, it was confirming my style. I was like, I can dress like this in the modern age and be it okay. And for it to be accepted by people and, I just remember being so happy in those years. From a true fashion perspective, what are some of like the key tenants that you extrapolated from Gucci and that time there that really taught you something about style and fashion and self-presentation? It was definitely about having fun and being authentic to who you are as a person and you can see that in the shows a lot, but something that I loved and that I learned while working there and that I always share with everybody is, you know, when, when you're dressing yourself, go to these higher end designer stores or department stores and try some clothes on. Go see what a great jacket is, go see how it's supposed to fit you. Try on some incredible pants and see how they drape on you. And even though you're not going to buy that piece, you're training yourself and you're learning about your body on how beautiful clothes are meant to fit you. And you can train your eye and you can find that in the high street and kind of recreate it in your, in your own way. That's such good advice because, you know, a lot of things these days are very surface level or we're just exposed to them on social media, but actually feeling the inner workings of a luxury garment on your body and experiencing what that level of like craftsmanship and tailoring and just the, the consideration is like, um, you know, teaches you a lot and gives you somewhere to go and maybe also gives you a better understanding of why things cost what they cost too. Yeah, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. What about some of the like gender bending, androgynous, gender fluidity, um, sort of the movement that really was put forth a lot at Gucci and has influenced many other brands? Um, what did you think about that? How suddenly it was, you know, a house and a place where people like, Harry Styles, for instance, were dressing in a way that was expressing more like flamboyance and not adhering to strict gender norms. I think this all happened at a perfect time because I feel like fashion was so stuck in its ways. And I don't want to say that I was biased, but I was learning so much of the brand, of the brand because I was working there. But I just, I remember... Um, this must have been spring 2016 when Harry Neff walked down the runway, a trans model and actor. And I was just like, oh my gosh, what is happening? This is incredible. Like I've never seen this happen in a in such a mega brand like Gucci. You might have seen it in like, you know, maybe lesser known brands, but to be at a for the forefront of fashion, to be sending trans models down the runway, it was mind blowing to me. And I was so proud to be working for a brand that was so ahead of its time. And I remember seasons later, a lot of other brands followed suit. And again, it taught me to be myself because 
I, I don't necessarily, I can't say that I'm masculine, but I can't say that I'm all the way feminine. I'm somewhere in the middle and I like being in the middle. I like being in that in between and playing with the more feminine pieces and mixing it with masculine pieces. I feel like there's something very modern about dressing in that way. And when you shop, uh, both online and in person, do you just kind of eschew the gendered sections of retail? Because it still is very divided, sometimes even by a floor, right? Do you just go wherever your instinct is calling you and whatever style and color you're drawn to? You're right. It is very divided. And I think naturally I go to the women's section because it fits me better. I'm a little bit short. I'm five foot three. So a lot of the menswear pieces, like the shirts, the sweaters, they're just a little too long on me. And what I love nowadays is, you know, when you go in the women's section, there are a lot of pieces inspired by menswear. So I can kind of mix and match um, so I can find my own kind of personal style. Do you have a favorite, before we move on from Gucci, do you have a favorite piece that you acquired during that time that, um, that you still love and treasure? I feel like I can't pick a favorite, but if I were to pick a category, it would be my blazers. I, I feel like tailoring is hard to, good tailoring is hard to find on the high street. You have to be lucky to find something that's so incredibly well-made and cut to perfection. And I don't regret spending a lot of money on the blazers. Because <laughs> you have them forever. Yeah, I, I wear them all the time, literally all the time. If I'm filming, when I'm not filming, I throw on my favorite Gucci blazer and it's and I'm ready to go. Well, and that's where there's really a lot of overlap, right? Because when you started your YouTube channel, you're still at Gucci and you're needing to film yourself on camera, which is very different than how we just dress for day-to-day -day life and just you know, show up in the world when you have to look at yourself on camera back and edit it, you have to really make sure you like what you're seeing. Uh, so how did you first start to approach dressing for on camera? Because you're so good at it. And even if we don't have a YouTube channel with a ton of subscribers like you do these days, we're all still on camera all the time, right? With Zoom meetings, etc. Like, how did you figure out how to really look great on camera and feel like yourself? Thank you so much. I feel like my best advice would just be, be yourself. Wear something that you feel good in or feel confident, feel powerful. And that's going to translate on camera. It just, it just will. It's, it's like, it's like putting your favorite little black dress or your, your favorite blazer or your favorite top. It's going to help with that confidence when you're on Zoom or when you're filming anything, or even when you're not on camera. When you show up feeling good, people will see it. So take us back to the early days when you first started putting yourself out there on YouTube and wanting to really entertain and educate people around your love of interior design and your decorating process. Uh, did you initially feel like this was super connected to your style and your work in fashion, or did this feel like a really divergent route you were taking? It, I, I was scared at first. I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know what people are going to think. I don't know who's going to listen to me. But I did feel like I had something to share with the world. So I was like, let me press record and let's just see what happens. Mm. I also really think that it happens for people at different stages in life, but when you're developing your style, like to have it truly be holistic, you need to feel like your environment also matches your style. It's not enough to just have, you know, the right outfit. You also want to feel like your space is a reflection of that. And I don't know, Arvin, I remember when I was living in New York, people used to think I was crazy because I would spend so much time decorating my tiny apartments and people were like but no one ever sees that but it's just you and I was like that's still so important to me 
when did you realize that like your surroundings and your environment, that you had this natural desire to want to curate them and have them be aligned with your, with your personal style? You know, it wasn't until my fiance and I bought our first home together, I found myself being so creative and I was finding these like affordable solutions and how to decorate. At the time, I really had no idea what it meant to furnish a home. And I was looking on social and on YouTube and I was just learning. I was, I was like spreading myself thin. I was like learning how to do this. I was learning how to, to, to grow into my personal style. And I was learning how to, okay, how do I find the best value furniture that will take me, you know, into the next phase into my life? What should I buy? What should I not buy? And I think naturally as, as you learn, you're going to make mistakes. And the same goes with, with fashion. It's, it's like a trial and error. It's, it's a journey. And yeah, it, it, it was really such a beautiful time in my life when we first moved in. I was like, and that inspired what I do now, my YouTube channel. Isn't this process of like trial and error, I find with interiors just so humbling because you, you know, it's, you never are done. Like there's always room for improvement and there's always uh, mistakes that get made along the way, right? Because when you're dressing yourself, you know your body pretty well and you know, you know, if something fits or doesn't fit or how to, but it's, it's really challenging, I find, uh, to understand proportions and space and make an environment come together in the way that you're intending. Oh, it really, I'm not going to sit here and say it's, you know, furnishing a home is easy. It really is so hard. And, you know, I wanted to share my design journey on YouTube because I felt like the lessons that I was learning could be valuable to someone. And I just wanted to share my tips and my tricks and stuff that I learned along the way because it is so hard. <laughs> it is. And there is, there is such an overlap these days between interior design and fashion. Um, did you find that a lot of the references that you were drawn to early on and still today came from fashion and your background in that industry or was interior design just like a whole separate thing to you? At first, it was separate. I wasn't sure how to tackle this big project, which was my home. And I thought, you know, I feel like fashion and interior design do kind of meet somewhere. And I was like, okay, well, let me play with scale and proportion and let me play with contrast and you know, let me think of the best colors that go together. And I was finding myself in my closet looking for inspiration for my home. And it's something that I talk about a lot. It's like, you know, if, if you're stuck, if you don't know your next interior design move, go to your closet. Something might spark this inspiration, whether it's a color palette from a boot. I have this beautiful boot by Dries Van Noten and it had, has this like burnt red and rich browns. And that color combo to me felt kind of unexpected and fresh. And I was like, let me use this as a jumping point to inspire the color palette of my office. Or maybe it's, you know, the an oversized blazer will inspire an oversized piece in in your home. And I always share this t with people that are feeling, oh, I don't know what to do in my space. Something in your closet will inform your next move. Wait, I love that because I also find too, a lot of times what can happen with people is they'll be super opinionated about their wardrobe and what they wear and their closet is really a, a true reflection of pieces that they've curated that are unique to them. And, and, you know, especially when you work in retail, people will tell you right away, they're like, that's not me. They know who they are. And then you go out into their living room and it's just a, it's like a catalog sea of beige. 
And you're just like, where did the personal style go? For some reason, I think sometimes people can lack like the confidence to continue that through line of their personal style within their space, which is why I think your channel has been such a great resource because you kind of, you embody that and you live that by example and you're giving people some like tools and tricks of how they can do that themselves. Did you ever feel like hesitant? Because sometimes you'll be very opinionated and you'll tell people, get rid of this thing, especially when it's, you know, a farmhouse live, laugh, love sign or something super cliche. Like, why did you want to really uh, take a stance there and uh, sound off? Because those have been some of your most popular videos, no? Yes, it, it. those videos really have taken off on my channel. And I remember filming them, both my mom and Andrew were like, are you sure you want to say that? Like, are you sure you want to... It, I, I don't know, you might offend some people, but, you know, being on YouTube, you have to find something that makes you different. There's already so many channels and so many people saying, I love this, do this and go for this. But there what I, I wasn't finding a channel talking about home decor saying, don't do this because it's not really modern. It's not relevant. And I, you know, maybe have ruffled a few feathers here and there, but it wasn't until I was like, let me just say how I feel. I found my audience. I, I found people that were looking for the design advice that I was looking for when I was starting out my design journey. Yeah, that's actually how I initially found you because I had a girlfriend who was hell bent on getting one of those ridiculous restoration hardware cloud sofas. And I'm like, no, you cannot get this sofa. Everyone has this. You don't want right. this. You want it because you, you think you want it because you've seen it everywhere. And I remember I put in YouTube like cloud sofa review so I could send her, you know, some of the trash that people were talking about it online. And <laughs> the algorithm served me up one of your like do's and don'ts videos. And I was immediately hooked because I, that's a, it's a similar it's similar to what I'm trying to do with people's personal style and fashion is just make you realize that you can make a more unique choice that's also like a better investment too um, that you're not going to want to get rid of in a year. I totally agree, and I, I think this goes back to earlier when you said you know people are afraid to decorate their home and kind of bring that through line. I, fe I feel like people are afraid because furniture is expensive. It is so expensive. And I learned that early on in my design journey. So it was like, how do I convey this message of like, you just have to buy and shop well, and you're going to keep that piece forever. I'd rather be surrounded by pieces that are, you know, so special to me than pieces that are just so so that I'm going to replace in the future because I'm just going to spend more money in the long run. And I've learned all of those lessons in just the last two years. You've given yourself like a crash course in interior design just by com immersing yourself and also experimenting in your own space. And you know what, like as a society where they don't teach you in school, in regular school, right, how to design your space or do your taxes or all these really important life skills. But, you know, we're taught to match and we're taught to like fall in line and do things like correctly and what we see, you know, to kind of hit the status quo. Maybe you can talk a little bit too and educate us about your philosophy when it comes to this idea of like contrast and mixing different elements. Because a lot of people's natural inclination is to get, you know, the sofa and the table and the side table that all match and are even sometimes the same material. Yeah, I think it's such a dated kind of rule to follow where everything should match. And I think this goes um, to interior design and in fashion. We live in the dig digital age where you have access to homes and spaces and clothes that you never would have just a few years ago. And, you know, we have like Instagram to do that for us. So I think people are slowly changing the way they shop. 
And I love seeing that because, you know, when, when you think of like, when you think back in the day and how maybe your parents or grandparents used to shop, they would go to one store and buy the whole set, right? And like, it's easy. That's interior design. But now we're really seeing this shift of like, mixing and matching from different places and eras and cultures. And I think that creates this beautiful alchemy of who you are as a person, whether that's for your home or for your wardrobe. Opposites attract, you know, the shiny Absolutely. with the matte, the metallic with the flat, the rough with the smooth, like bringing these elements together makes each one feel more unique and special, both in your wardrobe and in your home. But I think what you show so beautifully is you can make it all feel cohesive when there's a a clear color palette. Yes. um, I think that's one of the design tips I always swear by. It's like, I'll get questions like, oh, I don't have an eye eye for design like you. How do I make my space feel cohesive? And I think the simple answer is you have to nail your color palette and be strict with yourself. Don't buy something that feels so left field because then you'll be distracted when you're at home. If you stick to your colors and your color palette, then you're going to have that cohesive home, even if the styles kind of, you know, don't match all the way. And I feel like it's okay to have it be a little bit off. You know, when you're designing a room, if everything is so perfect, it feels a little bit flat. Mm. Throw something in there that kind of messes it up a little bit, you know? Makes the eye kind of twinkle a little bit or question something or dart around the space. Yeah, it's that contrast and that tension that your eye craves. Mm Mm-hmm. You're also like, because we DM about shopping stuff all the time, you are an expert shopper. What is your approach or how do you also, you know, a part of it is also saying no to things, you know, not just buying everything that catches your eye. Like what is your approach to making really smart purchases for both your home and your wardrobe? Do you have any rules or restrictions? I think it really takes time to get to know your body and your home. I think with social media nowadays, everything is so fast. Shows are coming out so fast. Trends are coming out so fast. And you have to kind of maybe tune that out a little bit and just take it slow and, you know, get to know your body, get to know your space and see what fits you the best, what looks the best in your home before you make a a move on buying something. Because Building your wardrobe is expensive. Building your home is expensive. And you you really kind of want to make as little mistakes as possible. Don't be afraid to make them, but, you know, you make calculated risks, right? Like, don't just buy the next best thing because you see it everywhere. Maybe take a step back and just, you know, learn and, and just wait before you buy that, that thing. I think it's just taking your time. Mm-hmm. I like to ask myself like three, I make, I, I, I make myself answer all these little questions just to make sure, just to create a little bit of a roadblock before I just immediately, because these days you can click to buy a lot of things. Um, and especially with furniture, it's so important to make sure you measure things prior because um, they are such big purchases. I agree. I think, too, that really helps me out for my home is creating a mood board. I love using Canva. It's a free app online where you can create these little pages and mood boards where you can bring the pieces you already have and the furniture that you want to buy. And you can kind of see how are they playing off of each other. And you're going to see right away if that chair is going to work or maybe it's a little bit off. That's such good intel. I get friends that will send me all the time. They'll be like, do you like this chair? Or do you like this boot? And I'm always like, I can't tell you unless you show me what you're planning on wearing with it or where it's going in the space. Like it's all about context. It's not, you know, these items aren't just sitting on a 
on a whiteboard somewhere, they're being incorporated into your life. So they have to mesh well, they have to play nicely with the, with the other um, components. So um, let's move on to the rapid fire section as we wrap up here um, to ask you a few quick questions. You can answer them as briefly or, or lengthy as you would like. Uh, but I'd love to know whose style is inspiring you currently. Kelly Wurstler. That woman can do no wrong. I mean, I just like whew, the fashion, the interiors. It's all very captivating. She never stops evolving either. Like She never gets stuck in one set style or look. She's always curious and pushing her eye forward. Yeah, she's uh, so brave. She's so brave. Have you met her yet? No, I want to. I, I feel like I live at the proper hotel and I just like <laughs> wish she'll walk down the aisle and like, uh, I'm just going to be like, hi, you don't know me, but I'd love to get to know each other. <laughs> I'm sure she knows who you are by now. Um, who would you love to style? It could be someone in your life or somebody famous. And when I say style, it's the whole theme of this conversation, Arvin. It's their home, their wardrobe. It's all connected, right? I would love to style Sydney Sweeney's new home. She just bought a Tudor home in California, completely opposite of what you think her style would be from seeing her character in Euphoria. That would be a unique challenge because, yes, in L.A., they randomly do have a lot of these Tudor style homes, which is a style that like comes from England and is quite historical and heavy. And so you, it's sometimes a challenge to make it feel right in California and still light and fresh and sunny the way that that environment is. But I'm sure I'm sure you could do that. That would be a fun challenge. It would be. Uh, who comes to you most in your life for style advice? My mom and my audience. <laughs> and it's like a 60-40. Yes, yes. The comments. Do you ever have to like almost say to people like, you need to hire a professional. I'm a stranger on the internet. Please leave me alone. Or do you like getting really involved? Sometimes I will, I'll dedicate like 30 minutes replying to comments on socials and, and YouTube. And I reply to as many as I can. And, you know, if it's a fashion question, I, I like to answer them. And then after the 30 minutes, I leave it alone because sometimes it does get a little overwhelming. Definitely. Uh, whose home would you love to visit? Mm. Jean Royer. I'd mm. love to travel back in time and just like soak up his work like a sponge. I just like, I can't... I, I think it's so amazing that his work from the 30s and 40s and 50s is still so relevant today. I love the proportions too, because oftentimes furniture from earliest 20th century can feel a little like people were smaller, spaces were smaller, mm -hmm. but there was just such a grand and audacious scale to his work that I love that feels so modern now, yeah. right? The chunkiness. Yeah, absolutely. I think he was doing something in Paris at the time that was so different to what everyone else was doing. Mm, yeah, I went to a party once here in Miami and um, the, the hosts had his sofas in the living room and I was just like, oh! mm. and then the people were like, what? Someone was like, what, did someone step on your toe or something? I was like, no, that's just Jean Royer. And they were like, a who? But if you know, <laughs> you know. And if you know how much it's it costs, like you really unicorn. know. Yeah. They're so rare. Like even Kanye West yeah. had to, you know, wait for years and years before he could acquire them. Um, yes. What's a style mantra you live by? Mm. Shop smart, be true to your style, and wear what you love. Mm. Love that. What's the difference between fashion and style? Ooh. I feel like fashion is like a universal idea. And style is so, so personal. And what's one thing that is not your style? It could be fashion or decor or both. 
Mm, I am not excited that clogs are having a moment right now. Clogs? <laughs> and I'm not excited about electric fireplaces. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great one. And lastly, what is next on your wish list? Ooh. That's a great question. A little McQueen I'm number. Trying. I'm trying to... Th- I feel like right now, honestly, there's nothing. I'm kind of content. Right. Yeah, I, I feel like right now, fashion and interior... I'm kind of just like... I'm just chilling. I'm just hanging out. If something pops up, I'll know if it's for me. And I think this goes back to our early point earlier is like you just have to wait and not rush into things yeah sometimes when you're looking for something to to want you can't find it but when you're just relaxed and taking everything in then it sort of finds you it'll find me for sure Yeah, it'll find you i'm sure i'm sure <laughs> um Arvin, thank you so much for doing this today and taking the time to go down this style journey with us and explain to us some of the thinking behind your style. Um, I, I just really appreciate you taking the time and sharing with us so openly. Of course, I was so excited and thank you for having me.